Hello, ni hao. Welcome to Mandarin Mama Chit Chat by Mandarin Together, where two Taiwanese moms, Trista and Yao Yao, share their experiences in raising bilingual children, exploring identity, code switching, and embracing the joys and challenges of bilingual parenting. Come along with us on this exciting journey. Hey everyone, this is Yao Yao. Hey, I want to jump in here and make sure everyone goes to show notes at the end of this show and download our freebies. Krista and I created a lot of amazing freebies for you guys to work with the kids. We are also preparing courses, so make sure you follow us so you get the latest updates. It's gonna be so amazing. I think the kids will have a lot of fun using these activity sheet to learn culture and Mandarin language. All right, let's start the show. Hi, I'm so excited about today's episode. Today we are interviewing Gwen. Gwen, she is a mother of two. She is also the owner of Culture Tater Tots. Gwen created Culture Tater Tots to empower parents to promote culture through play. Gwen created these play kits for different festival holidays, so kids can learn culture through playing. Gwen is actually American-born Taiwanese. She's born and raised here in the United States, but because her father is really adamant about Mandarin language and culture, so she can actually read, write, and she speaks perfect Mandarin, which I was so impressed because because I don't find a lot of American-born Chinese that can read and write Chinese language. So let's hear about Gwen's story and her journey. Hi, Gwen. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. So, I first found you on Instagram, and I love all your posts with your kids. I love how you teach them culture through play. So fun. And one of the reel I saw on your Instagram, I think you were at a conference. You were speaking on stage, and what you said there like really resonated with me. How you created, well, why you created cultural tater tots, and how you kind of want to extend that、um, to empower other parents to teach culture to their kids from playing, from play. And I think that's that's definitely our goal too here with Trista and I, and that's why we started this podcast. We want to kind of empower parents out there, empower ourselves with our kids because we both have two kids. We want them to. Learn the culture, the language, and pass down that heritage, right? So, can you start with introducing yourself, your background, and tell us all about culture tater tot? Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. And、um, yeah, I started culture tater tots、uh, during the pandemic. I remember my daughter was one. I think she just turned one. Yeah, she just turned one. And it was Dragon Boat Festival, and since everyone's quarantining, our pod included our parents.、Um, so they set up, you know, for an activity, set up、uh, to bao zongzi, you know, to wrap、uh, sticky rice、um, zongzi. And as we were doing it, I was just like, "Am I going to be able to do this for my kids? Because I don't know how to do any of this, right?" Like. I would say, growing up, my parents really taught us a lot about culture, and I think I'm a little bit abnormal in upbringing that sense.、Um, but even for me, I don't fully know all the gaps. I know we do certain things. I don't necessarily know the why. So I think I started thinking, like, I'm sure this is an issue for a lot of us who grew up here,、um, who may not have been in immersive environment. So I started making little kits for my friends, and at first it was just like ten kits, and I sent them to my friends, ten or twenty kits, and I sent them to my friends, and they were like, "Oh my gosh, <laughs> this is amazing!" They're like, "We learn so much from it too," and they're like, "A lot of times I don't feel qualified to teach my kids about culture because I don't even know it that well myself." So I think that really gave me the encouragement to. You know, continue with the Instagram, but also continue creating play kits because kids learn through play, and they learn without even realizing that they're learning. Especially the years between like one and like whatever six,、um, I think they absorb so much through play. So I think that's where I focus a lot of my energy, and plus my kids are in that age range as well, so it's easier. But yeah, I started it really to 
you know, learn myself also, but also help a lot of parents who similarly grew up here or, you know, I've met so many parents in different situations, even parents who have adopted or maybe, you know, they married someone of the Chinese culture and they're not of that culture and they're trying to help their kid understand that half of their identity. So these are all different types of family I've met um, through Instagram. Yeah. Oh, I totally agree because what you said earlier, it, it's exactly Trisha and I were talking about and working on because we interviewed Janae last week and she is Caucasian. She moved to China, mm. right? And she yep. wants to, and she's learning that culture and the language. My sister-in-law, she's from Ecuador. She married into mm. yep. a Taiwanese family and she's now learning Mandarin and the culture and all that. And a lot, are you Chinese? Are you born here in the United States? I was born here. My parents are from Taiwan. Oh, Taiwan. Okay. Oh, we're from yeah. Taiwan too. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So we're, we're not born here. I, I, I moved here when I was 14. So I can read and write. I know all the culture in that, but I do see friends that they grew up here, maybe second and third generation. And like you mentioned earlier, they don't know much about the culture and the language. But now they've become a parent. They're like, oh, we want that with our kids or it's just going to be lost, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's like being lost. But also, I think your cult, even though being born and raised here, like, yes, American, but at the same time, a part of our identity comes from, you know, our cultural background. So I think not being able to speak in that language, there's a lack of closeness with that identity. Um, so I, I've i met, you know, people who have been here, like, they're like fifth generation, and their family wow. haven't spoken Mandarin in like generations. And this is something they seek because they just feel like they need that closeness with their culture. So I, I think it's, it's it's a more complete picture of your identity when you really fully able to know and verbalize both sides of your identity. Um, so yeah, so I think that's partially why even growing up here myself, um, I've come to see how much I appreciate knowing both sides of my identity. Um, I think it makes us really unique in a sense, like the third culture kid thing. I think it makes us really unique in a sense, but you, it's hard to feel complete without knowing that both sides of your culture. Yeah, I totally agree. Especially, I guess I never really realized it's a lot of self reflection after you became a parent, right? Yes. Became a mom. So yes. I have a four year old and a two year old. And yes. I guess so I would consider myself being versed in both American culture and Taiwanese culture because I grew up there and I moved to America when I was 15. But um, I guess I never realized that until. I have my own children and uh, I'm like, oh, okay. But the thing is I'm lacking is because everything was, because I grew up in the culture, right? Like I know about the culture, but about keeping or pass it on it is something yeah. that there's a gap, right? And I feel like I'm all, I'm kind of reconnecting to my own culture, like Taiwanese culture to yeah. try to pass it on or introduce to my kids. And the first time, I don't know, epiphany or like um, um, the moment that I'm like, oh, I really need to pass on this legacy or pass this culture to my own kids is uh, it was Moon Festival and we're reading this book about making moon cakes and things like that. And then my son, uh, three year old then, he really wanted to make the moon cakes and which I failed him. So yeah. hopefully uh, this year for the moon festival we can actually make it together. So I feel like there's a lot of because I grew up in Taiwan, you don't I don't know. I feel like you don't just don't need to make mooncakes, right? Or like even the dishes, the cuisine, it's just like mm-hmm. it's so it's accessible. You're surrounded. Yes. Exactly. exactly. And but now I feel like I need to up on my game and then like fill that gap. And so um, yeah, and then do it. Because like culture is like you live in it, right? Yes. So everything yeah. comes so naturally. But when you are not in the society, not in the culture, right. it's kind of hard to I guess incorporate that into everyday life but that's yeah and you almost have to go above and beyond to create that atmosphere right like Mm -hmm. around lunar new year families in taiwan or china they don't have to create that atmosphere they feel it it's in the advertisements it's all over the excitement is there but here it's it's not like that so you almost have to find your way to generate that excitement and 
that routine for them of like, oh, like after New Year, it's going to be Lunar New Year. And I'm starting to see that with um, my older one, Ava. She's able to recognize like after we do New Year, she's like, oh, we got to take the decorations down. We need to pick put up the red decorations because, you know, she's starting to recognize that pattern. But um, without creating that excitement or anticipation around a certain holiday that nowhere else really does it, you know, their friends don't do it. I think that's super important. Um, And we take that for granted, you know, when you live in a different country, it's like Christmas, right? Like there's so much atmosphere here and like they learn it in school. They're all excited. They hear about it from their friends. Um, We have to kind of generate that through different ways. Uh, And for me, like play is the best way because they get excited for it, right? They're like, oh my gosh, last year, like you said, we made mooncakes or we play like mooncake play-doh like that's what i that's what they associate with that memory um so yeah so yeah i totally agree it is um an extra hurdle and effort that we do have to put in so i'm really interested in hearing more about your play because you mentioned it right and just like i guess what elements or what kind of activities do you build in for your play kit yeah yeah so um Play kits, I think it's centered around a lot of things that my kids are interested in. So for this most recent one with Mooncake and Mid- Mid-Autumn Festival, I did a play kit with um, Mooncake molds and Play-Doh. And you're able to like create very easily. I think some, the stamp ones are kind of hard for kids. So this one is really fun because you squeeze it in and you like bang, 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 and it just falls out. And, you know, two-year-olds can do it. Like that's how simple it is. Um, so that kids love. And I also did a dry erase activity book, uh, where they can, they're learning about culture, but they're also doing a lot of activities like, you know, connect the moon cakes, like look the same or find what's different and also learning the story about Tonga. So I, those were, and also a lantern, so they can make a lantern for it as well. Um, so these are activities that within, and I think kids just naturally love play-doh mm. uh play-doh and also um what do you call it the sand uh kinetic sand it also works with kinetic sand so that's really fun but they just like love it and i've had the parents tell me their kid has been making play-doh moon kit uh cakes with the kit for hours they're like literally this is the best thing because you know they're just off playing on their own and having so much fun uh while doing something that they didn't really realize that it's part of culture right so um yeah that that's the most latest hit and i'm hoping next year to do a few more for the different not just holidays but also just in general more evergreen type of um kids for the kids too but really like marrying the kids interest with an element of culture i think that's where you find a magic in the kids so we talk about the culture aspect, right? And then uh, just want to shift uh, the focus a little bit to the language element. So I guess I share a little bit about you growing up. Were you, I guess, raised bilingual or and how are you like in terms of your kids? Are you also speaking Mandarin or teaching the Mandarin as well? And how's that going? Yeah. Um, so growing up, my dad was always adamant about us learning Mandarin. Very adamant. So actually, for the first few years of my life, I exclusively spoke Mandarin. Um, it wasn't until school. I went into school not speaking any English, essentially. I had to go to ESL because I just like didn't really speak English. Um, so they really created immersive environments, whether it's like watching Shouting Down cartoons or, you know, whatever. All of my books were in Mandarin. Um, so and plus my my um, grandma, uh, my nai nai, she was a elementary school teacher in Taiwan. So she was living with us full time. And before I even went to Chinese school, they, she was teaching me how to write and read. So by the time I was going to Chinese school, I could read and write. Um, so that was like my upbringing. And he was adamant. Like he never gave up. Very adamant. Even as we grew up like in high school and college his rule was like, when you're in my house, like you, we speak Mandarin, like that's just how it is. So I think that persistence just made an expectation. Like when I come home, I just speak Mandarin. I speak Mandarin to my brother. That's just the expectation. Um, so that's how I was able to retain and really continue, I guess, my bilingual journey. So now with kids, I'm trying to, it's hard, but 
trying to create that environment for them. So Ava, growing up, the first few years spoke completely Mandarin. So I think that's why I think starting off with a really strong foundation, when their vocabulary is higher in a certain language, in the minority language, they tend to want to express themselves in that language because they're able to do so more, you know, um, better. So right now, that's still her dominant language, thankfully. Um, It's harder because like my husband, he understands and speaks a little Mandarin, but mostly we converse in English. Um, But with my kids, I speak 100% Mandarin. And with the grandparents, they speak Mandarin to them too. But they're both in school now. Uh, so yeah, so that's that's how like the bilingual journey has been. So far, it's like laying that really, really strong foundation. And whenever possible, created that immersive environment. So if we're watching Netflix, right, um, we are turning it in Mandarin audio. So they've watched like, you know, Gabby's Dollhouse in Mandarin. And, and I think just hearing it has been super helpful. And growing up for us, my dad was always bringing back audio tapes from Taiwan, lugging it back. So I was listening to like the Monkey King, like Xi or Ji in, in Mandarin. So I think this audio aspect of it is super important. Yeah. <laughs> wow. You So you can read and write in Mandarin? Yeah. So I like type and stuff with my parents in that's, Mandarin. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's really crazy because I, <laughs> I, I don't know much like American board. Like Chinese yes. and Taiwanese yes. that can read and write. That's really impressive. Yeah. yeah, I would say like I'm definitely the abnormal. Like yes. I'm not the norm. But I think a lot, honestly, my dad was like consistency and also hearing it, um, constantly hearing it. I think those two are so important. Uh, so that's why like even screen time, that's when we like really like you watch it in Mandarin. And they like it in Mandarin. They tell me to turn it on in Mandarin. Um, so, and now like resources are so readily available. So creating that inverse environment, I think is really important. Yeah. And I can do doing fuhao and stuff like that. <laughs> wow. Yeah. You said you, you have a brother, younger brother. Yeah. yeah. So he can read and write as well, or you're just extra smart. <laughs> or no, like no, that no. language he, skill. He, he he speaks fluently as well. Uh-huh. I would say reading and writing probably not as strong, but he can do it. Yeah, wow, he can do it. I Maybe think the we... second child always like yeah. struggles a little bit more because the older child brings in more English, you know, mm-hmm. and they just get a little bit less of like you know constantly oh, yeah. playing certain music, you know. So it's just a different experience. We need to uh, interview your dad next time. Yeah. Oh my God, he'll love it. He'll tell you all his thoughts. <laughs> wow, I'm just so impressed. Yeah, it's not he's easy. Very, very consistent. I think insistent on consistency and insistent on hearing it, like the audio aspect of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So question, right? So um, you said, it's like my personal question. So my husband doesn't speak Mandarin either. Yeah. And I think I just did that easier route or lazy, whatever you call it. I did not create that. I was not persistent enough. Yeah. Uh, I did not create the all Mandarin. Like I did not just speak Mandarin to my kids. So now Leo, my four-year-old, he is, um, English is definitely his dominant language. He understands what I'm saying, but yeah. like, he only replies English and then at age four, three, actually l- last year, he after I don't want to confirm it, but he he would ask me to speak English, right? Oh. Just because I did not lay the foundation expectations down for him. So now I guess I don't want to say his identity, but I am the only person who's mentoring to him. And then so, and he knows that I speak English and I've been speaking English to him, like half English, half Mandarin. Yeah. I guess I love the expectations. Maybe like start now, right? Maybe I just start in, like he has now so many. He has a lot more vocab- vocabulary now because in preschool and he you know he talks yeah. so much, full on sentences, paragraphs, and stuff. And I guess I would just I don't know. I yeah. I would like say like find your consistency, right? Like whatever consistency is, like do that. Um, I think it's helpful to set the expectations. Like, hey, like when we're home. I'm going to speak Mandarin to you. You know, you, you're you free to speak what you want, but you, you if that's the expectation, like I'm going to continue just to set the expectation. And then third is also explaining to them why it's so amazing 
that you can speak two languages. That's like a superpower, right? And explaining to them, like, I don't know if you have family or like for my kids, I'm like, you know, like we want to keep practicing because we want to keep hanging out with Aman. Like they only understand Mandarin. I mean, that's what I tell them, but, um, and they're like, you don't want to forget it. Right. And they're like, yeah, no, no, no. So I think explaining to them a little bit of the benefits of why being bilingual is so amazing. You can tell them like, so many people in the world speak so many languages, right? Like speaking more languages, you can talk to people. It's like a super, and you can connect it with something in the cartoons, you know, like in Encanto, there's that little boy that speaks to animals, like that's his superpower. So explaining in that way may get them a little bit more excited and understanding why you're not just being like super like uptight, <laughs> but really like getting them excited about it too. It's just like that that makes you so special, you know, that makes you, you know, you're able to go and travel the world, you know, in, in the future and meet a lot of different people. You can order at restaurants, um, whatever, like age wise makes sense for them that can get them excited and connecting with something that they can relate to in their cartoons or whatever things that they watch. Um, I think that can be helpful too. Yeah. Um, my daughter, she's a little older. She's 11 now. So I get a lot of pushback. So from zero to five, she speak Mandarin only, like before kinder. Yeah. And, but she did went to a uh, preschool. So, but at home, we still, the preschool is only three days a week for her back then. So her Mandarin was really, really good. Yeah. Uh, until kindergarten. Now <laughs> she's older now. She's, yeah. She'll speak. English, I'll, I'll speak Mandarin to her and she'll talk back in English. And I have to constantly, hey, speak Mandarin, speak Mandarin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I, I think it's a struggle, but like that, <laughs> that's the struggle. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And um, just as I think yesterday, a couple of days ago, I think she was saying something in Mandarin because she didn't want, I, I can't remember where we were at. Maybe she didn't want her friend to hear. It. And she's like, mommy, I think only here we can speak. Uh, Mandarin and nobody can understand because we just went back to Taiwan. She's like, but in Taiwan, I can't speak English because everyone will still understand English. I was like, that's right because yeah. English, yeah. like, you have to learn. You don't have to, yeah. but it's like the yeah. main language, right? They teach English in Taiwan, so if you speak English, yeah. most pe mostly people will understand. But if you see, yeah. she, she, so she was saying that if you speak Mandarin here, she can tell secrets and. Nobody can really understand. I say, yeah, I know, right? Like you said, Gwen, like this is superpower. So I just try to encourage her to speak more. And now she's older now and she wants to watch Taiwanese drama, like those, uh, Ocean Ju. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Said, no, okay. like, hey, I don't know if it's appropriate. <laughs> I try to find that semi appropriate. For the sake of, for the sake of bilingual. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, I make a rule with you. You have to turn off the caption. You just have to listen. And she's like, oh, yeah. okay. But, um, it's okay. She's watching Liu Xin Hua Yuan. So yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's kind of cheesy. It's nothing. It's not, it's actually appropriate, but it's a lot of, it's about a love story, right? Yeah. But it's kind of like cheesy. I was like, okay, you can watch a little bit only if I'm with you. So I can like, and monitor what's going on and explain <laughs> things but she doesn't really watch cartoon now so maybe that's a you know a way for her to to learn mandarin yeah yeah yeah, yeah no i think i watched a lot um of those like variety shows um or yeah. whatever my parents used to rent it i mean they they were they were the ones watching it but like just being there um absorb you you just absorb things you know regardless uh yeah I don't know how I made it through I think my dad was just very insistent like he's like my he just says like my English is not good so you have to speak in Mandarin to me so I think I don't know I think that's just uh I don't even know how I got through my teen how they got through with me in the teen years and just that was just never an option at home I felt like for me like that was just never an option so I think that's what forced us to continue. Um, and and yeah, through watching shows, like they got me, you know, music and CDs from Taiwan also. Like, so I listened to like Ame growing up um, or uh, yeah, like different artists uh, from Taiwan. So yeah, I think 
finding your way and finding that consistency, even when it's really hard, I think is really important. And just remembering that one day they will be appreciative of it. Maybe not today, but like one day, like no one has grown up saying like, oh my God, I wish I spoke one less language. Like I'm so upset. I can speak Mandarin, you know, like no one says that, you know? So more, the only thing I've ever heard is like, oh my gosh, I wish my parents pushed me more. You know, I wish I understand. You do just like, I'm Taiwanese, but I'm in Taiwan. I literally cannot communicate them or even understand, you know, and that makes them feel so foreign when they want to be closer. So I think just remembering that as parents, that even when it's hard, one day they will have appreciation no matter what level that they get to. Like maybe they just get to like, they just understand, you know, and they Mm -hmm. can't necessarily speak that well. That's something you can learn later on. But understanding from like a fluent perspective is hard to not do it from they're young. So I think it's remembering that one day they'll never like be like, oh my gosh, (laughs) I wish my parents never like taught me Mandarin or something like that, you know? Um, But know that any level of understanding is going to be helpful for them in the future and just keeping at it because I know we, we're we're not we're in an environment that's not conducive of that um <clears throat> so just kind of remembering the benefits of it and just finding the fun in it right and finding the motivation and helping them un- understand whatever they can of why we do this is important I love that I and I I have hearing some people say that too like oh I wish my parents have spoke to me more in Mandarin where I wish yeah. this and that that's really yeah. great perspective to push us going yeah um, and I was I shared with Trista in the earlier episode as well that we just have to try our best right I, yeah. not all of our kids gonna read and write that's right. you know and it's okay I mean it's great if your kids can read and write but some right. maybe they can listen some maybe they can converse right. and whatever it is and they maybe if they get more interested later on in life they can pick it up real quick they exactly. can learn how to read how to write when they when they are older but at yeah. least we have that found, set that foundation early on right. right yes yeah I think that foundation is something that it's just getting started early and, you know, you have so much benefits when you do it when you're young. They may retain way more than you realize. Like we were doing karaoke and I mean, I don't speak fluent Taiwanese. I can like understand like 60, 70 percent of it. But the songs, like I literally can sing the songs. I have no idea how I just still can sing the songs. And I would shock myself, you know, so I think you don't realize how much they take in at this age. Um, and just keep trying, like exactly you said, try your best, right? Like whatever level level they get to great, but you have already given them a foundation that they can build upon later in life. Like, yeah, you can read and write later. You can read and write. You can even like get better at speaking later. So I think it's that understanding of it, um, is really helpful to at least have that foundation. (laughs) Another quick question I have is how do you stay connected? I know your parents, I guess your family are here in the U.S. too, but how do you stay connected with the Taiwanese culture and how do you, I guess, pass it on or share that with your children as well in everyday life? Yeah, so I think my parents definitely play a really large part of it. Um, But I think now with like Instagram, it's a little bit easier and like internet, obviously, Um, YouTube, just to see like what's going on. in Taiwan. Um, I have cousins there as well. So, uh, and some cousins who grew completely grew up there and moved over when they were in college. So I think just having connections with family has really helped me. And then like whatever bits and piece I don't know, I just like research online and just like see, and I'm constantly learning new things. So I think that's like the fun part of this journey. <laughs> Do you go back to Taiwan? Sometime once yeah, a year. To, as a kid, we went back like every year. Um, and we haven't gone back, not by choice, but just between COVID and having kids the past few years, we haven't gone back. But we are going back in end of March. So I'm really excited. <laughs> and uh yeah, Ava's really like, Oh, when we go to Taiwan, like what are we gonna do? Like just like trying to talk about it and get her excited. She's like very excited about it. Uh, is it gonna be her no clue what to expect? <laughs> It's going to be her first time. Yes. Yeah. First time. 
Yeah, I'm 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 terrified of that flight. <laughs> but hopefully, hopefully they're just sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what, where where are you flying from? California? I'm flying, uh, no, from uh, all the way from Newark. Uh, not Newark, JFK. New, New York. Okay, okay. How? It's like a sixteen hour direct flight. Okay, yeah, that's same with me. When I live yeah. in Houston, and it's about uh, yeah. sixteen, seventeen hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But hopefully, it's okay. We'll see. And you will be staying in Taipei. We'll be staying in Taipei for the first week. To kind of like you know jet lag and everything, and then we're gonna do almost like a round tour kind of.、Uh, we're gonna go to Taichung, and then we're gonna go to Kaohsiung, and then Kanding, and then come back up.、Um, so yeah, doing that for like a week or so. They will、yeah. have so much fun, and the weather、mm-hmm. in March is great because、yeah. once they go to elementary school, you have no choice to take them back. I mean,、mm-hmm. you can take them back in winter time, but for me, it's like too short. So I、yeah. go back in summertime, and it's、oh, just、gosh. so hot. So hot. <laughs> yes, yeah. My parents used to take us out, like, whatever, and we would just go for like a month or or something.、Um, I would just have like a stack of homework that I'm doing, like throughout the trip, <laughs> to come back.、Um, but like once we hit like middle school, my parents like, okay, here this is like real school now, so you gotta like stay in school. <laughs> so I think we're gonna wrap up soonish. But I was wondering, I know like what you shared before basically is very kind of answered your question already. But I guess do you have any, I guess advice or maybe tips and strategy you could share with parents or caregivers who would like to. I guess incorporate either the language, the culture into their everyday life. Yeah, sure. I would say with、um, with raising your kids bilingual,、uh, cons- consistency is key, and also trying in some way creating that immersive environment. Whether it's in like audio podcasts I listen to or Netflix, but hearing it, I think, is so important, and they absorb so much. Whether it's music. Um, they absorb so much at this age and throughout, you know, their younger years. So I would say consistency and then hearing it in some format、uh, is really helpful. And then with culture, I think because we're not immersed in it, I think it's about mentally prepping your kids. Like, imagine you never knew Christmas was, and literally on one day you're suddenly like. Inundated with all the Christmas things that you're supposed to do, you're just like, "What the heck?" You know, like, "Who is this man?" Like with beard, you know, like I think that would be terrifying, right? So I think with culture, especially holidays, leading up to it doesn't have to be crazy, but the week leading up to it, start talking about it, right? And be like, "Ooh, like I'm so excited for the New Year because like I get to eat this. What are you excited about?" You know, trying to drum up that conversation. I think that helps them mentally prepare, so that when that holiday comes, they're not like shocked by like, now you dress in red, now you do this, like don't cut your hair, like all of these things. That's like so jarring for them, and I think they'll write it off as like, I don't know, this is just something I do. So I think、um, mental prep and trying to create that anticipation of some sort、um, is really helpful. And I think with younger kids, something would help is like, oh, like on this day, let's make dumplings or let's. Make you know Play-Doh mooncakes. Create some sort of activity that they are anticipating for. So by the time they get here, they're like, "Yay! Like this is we get to do this activity, and that's going to be their core memory." So、um, yeah, so I think that mental prep and that creating that anticipation for culture,、um, especially around holidays, is really helpful. Have there been any challenges or resistance? I、uh, have been, I guess, I with your older one. I was only four, and you said Mandarin、yeah. still dominant language. Yeah, I can definitely see English creeping in, especially you know whether it is like certain shows that doesn't have a Mandarin too, and then she watches in English.、Um, so I definitely see it creeping in.、Uh, but what I try to do is, if she says like she mixes English in, I repeat it back to her in Chinese. I don't force her to repeat it. I'll repeat it twice, like. Oh, do you mean that? You know, do you mean this or do you mean that?、Um, and normally she'll just repeat back, like, oh yeah, yeah, that's what I, you know, she'll say it, right? But even if she doesn't say it back, just hearing it again just reinforces it. So that's something I've done.、Um, and she she snaps back, like she she hasn't like got kept going down that route.、It's、just like occasionally she'll just drop in like an English word here and there, and I just repeat it back to her in Mandarin. So that's been kind of like my. Tools, I guess, I've been using、uh, lately. 
Do you send her to a Chinese school or do you teach her on your own? So, um, no, she hasn't gone to Chinese school yet. She has done it online with um, Beifei Kids. Uh, so she has done Bupa Mufa there. But she hasn't gone to Chinese school yet. Um, so purely just at home. Yeah. And I think most, honestly, like when it comes to language, I'm not saying reading, writing, but like language, most of it you're going to get from home. Like it's so hard to send your kids somewhere for once a week and expect them to, you know, retain a whole lot. So I think a lot of the foundation setting is going to be at home, um, sending them. Yeah. I think eventually like she will go, but I think creating that consistency at home is really key. Um, Chinese school is going to help, but it's not going to be like the solution for sure. So I want to know what is your goal for your kids? Is it just like, like your dad reading, yeah. writing and all that? Or I think most important is being able to understand and communicate um, in Mandarin. I think mm -hmm. humor, you know, humor sometimes just doesn't translate. And certain words to describe a feeling just doesn't translate. So I think being able to communicate um, in Mandarin helps you become closer in that sense. You're able to joke in a way that you can't. Um, it's just different types of humor and like play on words. You just can't really do that direct translation. It's just like super weird. So I think that generates closeness. For me, it's close to your family. Whatever helps them be closer to their our family and also closer to their culture, like that's my goal. Um, I don't really have like, I think I used to be like, oh my gosh, they need to like be all these things, but that just creates so much stress on yourself. And I was just having so much anxiety about like, what? Oh my gosh, she said one like English words is over. It's over. Like I was just freaking out. But um, I think it's, it's like, ultimately, what is your goal, right? My goal is for them to be close to our family and, you know, being able to absorb culture. So even if that's like not reading and writing fluently, like that's okay for me. Uh, but being able to communicate, I think that is super important. Yeah. And I feel like our goal will change too, because my yeah. goal changed. Because when yeah. my daughter was little, I, like you, I have this high yeah. goal. Like she's yeah. going to know Bupa Mufa by five and she yeah. can read and write by 10. And then yeah. now I'm just like more relaxed. Cause yeah. Cause it caused a lot of anxiety and fighting because yeah. now she's older now. Yeah. I can just like force her, you know, write right. this word for a hundred times. So now I'm just more relaxed and yeah. same. My goal now is, hey, because my, all my family is in Taiwan. If she's able to, and my, and my son, they were able to converse and talk to family. Yeah. And when we go back, you know, they can listen and have conversation with people then. I'll be so happy. I mean, that's my yeah, goal. Like, order some also, food, you know? Yeah. You know. And also, I want them to love the culture. Not, yes. not just, a, yeah, the, the language part is important, but like love where we came from and not like, yeah. oh, that's, I don't want to go back. It's boring yeah. or like they're shame yeah. or anything. I want them to love it and to embrace, right. embrace it. That's, that's my goal too. And when you talk about jokes, it just, I have this flashback when my daughter was little. We went back, always stay with my mom, and it was raining, and my mom was like, she speaks Mandarin only, so no yeah. zero English, zero. Yeah. And she said, make sure you bring umbrella, or else uh, 你会变成落汤鸡. Yeah. Like, what? <laughs> Mommy, uh, I must say, I'm going to 变成鸡汤, 鸡汤. So every time it's raining, I'm oh, 你会变成鸡汤. So yeah. It's like, it's funny, it's cute. And how yeah, do you yeah. say that? How do you translate that, Trista? Luo Tang Ji. I know, <laughs> I know. It's like, and like yesterday we were having <laughs> hot pot with my family and um, we were like, oh, this is, this is Di Gua. It's a Di Gua. And she's like, Mama, and we were just like cracking up because <laughs> obviously it's not feeding rodents to her. Um, but we're like, and then she thought it was funny and she was starting to joke around with that. Right? She's like, no, I want more Di <laughs> Shu. Yeah, yeah. I think um, and now for my kids, even they know what's Luo Tang Ji. I kind of explain yes, right? it's a rain. Yeah. But now they like to say Ji Tang Ji Tang. Mommy, yeah. you can say Ji Tang. Yeah. <laughs> Make sure you bring your umbrella. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yep. Uh -huh. So Gwen, can you tell us where we can find you? Like tell us where we can mm -hmm. find cultural tater tots and your Instagram. I'm going to link everything in the show notes, but you can go ahead and share with us. Yeah, you can definitely find me on Instagram at Culture Tater Tots. 
And I'm also on Facebook as well. So you can find me there. Uh, but yeah, those are the two main places. I'm on TikTok, but like, I can't, I can't, I'm, <laughs> I'm like, I feel too old. <laughs> I can't quite figure it out yet. So I am on TikTok, but I am not, I'm very behind posting. <laughs> so just find you everywhere at Culture Tater Tots. Yeah. And on, I have a site also. It's the same, culturetatertots.com. Everywhere. Um, nice. So if you want kits or anything, like that's where you can find the kit. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, no, thank you for having me. It was so nice chatting with y'all. Mm. <laughs> You're so inspiring and it, I love all your your goals, just your mission. You. It's just amazing what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Ciao. Ciao. <laughs> Bye. Well, I'll see you guys soon. Bye. Thank you for listening. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode with Gwen. Make sure you go check out Culture Tater Dots. I will link in Gwen's information in the show notes. Hey, if you guys enjoy our podcast, make sure you subscribe. We are bringing in more amazing, awesome guests just like Gwen. Share their journey and inspire and encourage each of us. So make sure you subscribe so you get the latest updates. And make sure you follow us on our social. I will link our social and email in the show notes. So you know where to find us. See you next time.